And with that, we'll go ahead and introduce our speakers today. So we're lucky to have Dr. Julio Rojas, who is a neurologist at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center, and Jennifer Merrilies, a nurse and researcher who has decades of work, well, I shouldn't say decades, but lots of work with caregivers. <laughs> and they are both experts in behavior management. So thank you for joining us. And I'll let Dr. Rojas take the mic. Dr. Rojas, we can't hear you. Thank you. I will take one second, just change the settings so like you can actually hear the audio of my. Uh... All right, so um, I will, the goals of this, this talk, this conversation are uh, to identify behavioral interventions as a key component on, of management of dementia. Um, there's, a, there's been an emphasis on using non-pharmacological management first, but I think providers in general, we are not uh, very well versed in what these are, how to use them, how to think about them. And my second aim uh, is at the end of the talk, I hope everyone will have a general idea about a structured approach to uh, target the difficult behaviors and address them. We'll see some 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 examples uh, in a, and then a, a case study at the end. So, the behavioral symptoms or what we call neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia are highly prevalent. Essentially, everyone with dementia will develop neuropsychiatric symptoms at some point. The neuropsychiatric symptoms are more prevalent as the disease gets worse with time. As as uh, the functional impairment is, is more severe. But severity is not the only factor that uh, um, is, is important. Uh, and, and the type of symptoms also varies, right? The majority of, of symptoms are mild, but a group proportion of patients, about 50% of patients may develop severe symptoms. And we, we, we think of severe symptoms as those that may uh, increase um, risk of harm for the patient or the caregiver or increased burden for the caregiver. This is a list of um, most, the most common symptoms in dementia. This is thinking of dementia, dementia in general, um, regardless of the cause of dementia. And as you can see, um, there's a high prevalence. Um, we measure the severity of symptoms with this uh, clinical scale developed by Jeffrey Cummings, the neuropsychiatric inventory score. And in general, you know, uh, apathy, depression, anxiety are, are highly prevalent. But sometimes, depending on, on the case, depending on the type of dementia, depending on the person sometimes, and a number of factors that we'll, we'll talk about or in depth, we can see uh, fa fairly disturbing, uh, rare, um, bizarre neuropsychiatric symptoms that can cause a lot of um, a lot of stress, like hallucinations, disinhibited behavior, socially inappropriate things. So we think of this as the whole the whole spectrum. As I said before, uh, not only severity is important, the type of dementia is important. For example, in this case, uh, this is a study from UCSF where they looked at. Um, early onset Alzheimer's dementia versus late onset. The difference is whether the dementia starts before age 65 or after. And uh, they observe that early onset dementia comes with more neuropsychiatric symptoms, higher prevalence, more severity, especially around anxiety, motor symptoms and night behaviors. So it's important to understand when we're working with a patient, what is the diagnosis of that patient? Uh, for example, in, in frontotemporal dementia, uh, especially the behavioral variant, symptoms, neuropsychiatric symptoms may be very prevalent as well, but maybe the flavors are a bit, a bit different. I, I, instead of anxiety, shadowing, depression, 
what you see are things like disinhibition or eating disorders are as the most most prevalent one. So it's important to to first know what type of dementia has the, has been the patient diagnosed with because that can help us understand the type of symptoms that we will expect. We, we can inform the families about what what sort of symptoms may emerge, and and we can we can understand what the plan of action is when a symptom emerges. Right? If we something very very atypical, we we may not attribute that as as a natural. Uh, um, course of the disease. So it's important to know what we're working with. So wh what is, why is behavioral management important? Mostly because uh, we don't have a way to treat dementia, so we have to support. This is one of the, the aims. Uh, the, the idea is, is to maintain a good quality of life when neuropsychiatric symptoms are not uh, treated. The quality of life goes down for both the patient and the caregiver. Also treat uh, symptoms that are not treated in pair with function. When we treat symptoms, the neuropsychiatric symptoms, people may be able to focus on, on the day-to-day -day function and be more effective, as opposed to if we leave them unattended, people become more dependent uh, instrumentally and, and for basic uh, tasks. Um, it's just well-being, you know, not, not being bothered by or being miserable but with depression or anxiety. You know, I tell my patients, we don't have a pill to bring your memory back, but fortunately we have interventions to, to treat depression, treat anxiety. So um, also having neuropsychiatric symptoms that are well-treated fosters a good environment for, for the family, for, for everyone. Um, and also this allows patients to engage uh, socially, cognitively, and more effectively. If we leave symptoms untreated, there's research showing that there's a high level of caregiver stress both professional caregivers and non-professional caregivers. Um, this can translate into health risks that go from physical injuries to cardiovascular events, to mood events. Um, people may be at risk of accidents, harm. You know, we hear about um, gunshot, gunshot wounds or um, altercations that result in falls. Um, and the quality of life in general is reduced for both people in the diet, the, the patient and the caregiver. Also, there's very interesting research, very, very powerful research showing that if you leave symptoms untreated, the disease progresses faster. And you may say, well, good that it progresses faster, right? We're, we're not extending the mystery. But uh, remember that those episodes come with a, a, a decreased quality of life. Um, and when we treat symptoms, we might be able to maintain someone in a, in a, in a good way so that person can enjoy the day-to-day -day better. And of course, having symptoms untreated brings the risk of more medications with side effects, sedation, falls, stiffness. So um, there's also high, higher risk of placement of people in, in facilities with are more uh, more secluding, more, more um, restricting environment. So this is a, a, a study that was done also in UCSF where um, they created a website with information about dementia and they tracked what people were, were interested in as they look at the website. And as you can see in this graph, over a course of a year, um, the, the page views per month were higher for information that con contain um, or, or pages that contain information about behavior, which basically reflects that the community wants to know about behaviors above anything. They also want to know about medications. But you see, there's another way of looking at it. The total, the total uh, the amount of time spent browsing at this website, uh, almost twice uh, uh, the time spent in behavior is seen compared to other information. So the community wants to know about behaviors. The caregivers have this in their mind all the time. It's, it's potentially one of the, the major needs. So the Alzheimer's Association and all these other associations that you see here, uh, the American Psychiatric Association and the American uh, Association, the Geriatrics, uh, American Geriatrics uh, Society, they all uh, propose to use um, non-pharmacological management as, as the first says first resource, they said these interventions should be tried first. And then uh, they're saying, well, we need to 
educate ourselves better about these interventions because we just hear them mentioned, but we really don't have formal training about this. So this, this talk it, it, um, aspires to, to touch on that, to, to have a sense of there's a, there's a structure we can bring to, to non-pharmacological interventions in dementia. So it's important, as I said before, to understand with what type of dementia we're, we're dealing, right? The, the biology is important. What brain regions are affected is important. We also need to understand who that person is uh, psychologically, psychosocially, what their bringing is, what their interaction, what their ecosystem, meaning their environment, their, their uh, companionship, their caregivers, because that um, affects how symptoms manifest. And that also can help us create strategies to address the symptoms. And of course, we might have acute um, um, insults in, into someone's uh, well being. It could be a medical disease uh, that uh, triggers the development of neuropsychiatric symptoms. So it's important to consider these three factors when we try to try to understand why a symptom emerges and how, how we're gonna uh, address it. In the biology realm, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of um, uh, neuroscience research on where in the brain symptoms are emerging. So if symptoms are presenting more on frontal parts of the brain or the back of the brain, that can tell you what sort of symptoms may emerge. Um, this is, this is you know, solidifies the idea that uh, understanding what type of dementia we're working with, what type of patient it's very important. There are things that we cannot localize in the brain that are multifactorial, like inappropriate eating, resistance to care. But in, in general, this is step number one, right? Understanding what so, sort of symptoms uh, patients have as part of their dementia syndrome. I show this uh, slide to the caregivers sometimes to, to educate, to show them in Alzheimer's disease that there is um, uh, atrophy of the areas uh, that, um, that deal with memory, that deal with language. And these people don't have the same machinery to respond to contingencies. And sometimes um, a need is manifested as, as what we see as a neuropsychiatric symptom. So this is important to, to understand the, the substrate in the brain of, of what's happening. We, in neurology, this is how we understand every symptom has a substrate in the brain. And then there's this uh, idea of the vulnerable brain. Right when you have atrophy, your systems may not engage in the same way to rescue you in a in a situation of contingency. The healthy brain, for example, has a very solid substrate, uh, a very uh, redundant, very highly functional. So you bring a lot of stress, like systemic disease or medications, or there's fatigue or lack of sleep, or you skip a meal, or you're just super tired because you've been concentrating. You know your brain is going to respond. Well, but in dementia, what happens is that base, that substrate is very delicate. So you can tilt that and cause dysfunction even with the minor stress, the, the, the most minor stress, like, like uh, skipping a couple of hours of sleep, right? You bring the same sort of uh, stressors and, and you'll, you'll develop what we, we call acute organic uh, failure or acute metabolic encephalopathy and that manifests as worse cognition, worse function, and emergence of neuropsychiatric symptoms. That's also second factor to, to consider here. So um, what are interventions? We classify them in this um, hierarchy as interventions, non-pharmacological interventions that um, at, uh, focus on the caregiver or focus on the patient. We call them uh, uh, person-centered or sensory stimulation in general. So the caregiver behavioral identifies specific problems uh, or situations that may elicit disruptive behaviors. And basically it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's education for the caregiver. And, and as you see here, I'm, I'm marked here with an asterisk, the level of evidence supporting whether it works or not in, in control studies or, or um, in, in, in large cohorts, if they're not controlling their observation. But, um, definitely psychoeducation and psychotherapy for the caregiver is highly uh, effective at, at understanding the management. And this is, you know, psychotherapy for the, for the caregiver is great. Psychotherapy, psychotherapy for the patient, not so much. And this is something that comes, comes up a lot. Can, can I send my, my dad with dementia to, to the psychotherapist? 
psychotherapy increases cognitive demand. And it, it's not, the, the, the evidence shows that symptoms can actually get worse. But for a caregiver, it's important to have education. It's important to have a uh, space to, to have psychological air and vent and, and have someone you know, to hear and to walk, walk them through. And we have um, um, some um, psychotherapists that are specialized in working with caregivers. And it's important to identify in our community who those, those uh, psychologists and, and counselors are. And then we have person-centered interventions. And these are, um, they, they basically focus on, on the patient's needs and the patient's values and uh, increase their potential to, to perform best and, to, and to, um, uh, to connect them with who they are. And th this has been viewed as, as the, the shortest path to, to uh, disrupt the presence of these symptoms. Um, these person-centered approaches uh, include tailored activity programs and needs-driven approaches uh, as the ones that have the best evidence of uh, efficacy. The tailored activity programs usually happen in conjunction with a, an occupational therapist. And, uh, you know, it depends on who, who they are, who, who, the, who people are, who the patients are, what are their needs, what are their, um, uh, their skills that they have historically. And, and sometimes you can develop uh, things that are enjoyable, uh, protocols of activities that are given a, as part of a structured routine, you know, uh, sleep, food, rest, and then activities that are tailored and that, that helps promote the sense of personhood, the sense of autonomy. Uh, working, there are, there are trials showing that working with an occupational therapist and, and giving these sessions in a controlled way help to reduce the symptoms. Then there's these needs-driven approaches that basically have to do with understanding who the person is, right? And, and providing them with activities, with accommodations that take into account how, how the person responds to certain stimuli. So, you know, this includes things like therapeutic lying sometimes, you know, not grounding people in reality and, uh, or, or, or what uh, Carla, which would call um, loving deception, you know, not, not focusing on, on the problem, but try, maybe trying to distract. Uh, other things like validation therapy, reminiscence therapy, simulated, press, simulated presence also have some evidence, but they, they may be more um, hit or miss. And then we have uh, uh, interventions that are not necessarily person-centered. They're more um, a wide net. And basically this include a, a, a forcing the senses to get distracted from the neuropsychiatric symptoms and, and trying to mitigate by distracting attention uh, and putting it on, on a very strong, pleasant stimulation, aromatherapy, massage, music, or multi-sensory. So, it is a wide ar uh, array of strategies. And if we use the strategies in the right combination for the right person, we have good chances of making a difference. Do they work? Well, there, is a, there are some, some meta-analyses showing that there's you know, a significant benefit. Uh, about half of them, there's gonna be significant improvement in, in neuropsychiatric symptoms. Uh, it, there is an agreement that is more, there's more high quality research needed especially control studies. And this is where, you know, you as professionals need to think about it, how to study it and, and make progress in the field to, uh, to try to address this need. But the evidence shows so far that there's at least similar efficacy to medications that are used to, to, to treat neuropsychiatric symptoms with the advantage that these interventions don't cause the side effects and they're not as expensive in terms of a monetary cost. They're expensive in, term, in terms of investment of time uh, but they may spare, you know, the side effects and all the cause that comes with the side effects of medications. Um, these interventions um, decrease the, 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 uh, the severity of the symptoms and improve caregiver distress, but they, don't, they may not make the symptoms go away completely. Sometimes the symptoms don't disappear and what you improve is just the well-being of the caregiver. Maybe, maybe the symptom is not stressful for the patient, but it's very disruptive for the caregiver. So by addressing them with non-pharmacological interventions, you help the caregiver to accept them better, to approach them better, and to reduce the level of stress. Uh, definitely reduction in the use of uh, neuroleptic drugs. And there's also some research showing that um, when you use these interventions, you have 
a lower chance of placing the person in a more restricted environment. So these are, these are good things. Um, but again, these are not cures that are completely 100% effective. They're, they're hit and miss, everyone is different. And the most important part is that there's no, no, no um, fixed prescription on what is going to work with every patient. You have to, you have to stay on, on, your, on your toes and help design a, an intervention that will work for that person. It's a little trial and error. So I'll spend the next few minutes telling you 10 principles, 10 ideas that hopefully will help you deploy these tools in your cases. The first idea is make sure that you talk to the providers, to the, the doctors, to rule out a medically treatable cause of these neuropsychiatric symptoms, especially when the neuropsychiatric symptoms are just new. They emerge in the acute or subacute setting over the last few, few days or weeks. In other words, is your patient having neuropsychiatric symptoms because this is part of an acute organic syndrome, a, a, a part of an acute delirium that you, you can treat? And this can be things like infections, urinary tract infections. It could be um, any physiological response like fatigue, hunger, sleep. It could be pain is a major one, abdominal pain, gum pain, joint pain. Not uncommonly, acute pain emerges as agitation, anxiety, resistance to care, and the symptoms improve when you treat the pain. And patients may not be able to articulate they have pain, but you know you have to keep uh, the idea of of, um, of a potential acute systemic cause as the as, as the origin of, of these symptoms. And this is high yield. This is very important. In step number one. Step number two: use a structured method to assess the symptoms. We have embraced in UCSF the DICE approach created by uh, Helen Kales in UC Davis now, where you, you have these four steps, describe, investigate, create a plan and evaluate for every symptom that emerges. If you do it in a systematic way, you'll be less likely to miss things especially in the part of investigation, which sometimes this is done in, in conjunction with your, with your primary care, with your neurologist. You, you, you investigate on, on, on the patient side, on the environment side, on the caregiver, those three aspects of the, the person's ecosystem. Then you judge uh, whether the symptom is, is severe enough to cause distress or, or to cause risk. And then you create your plan, right? And you attack uh, all the elements of the ecosystem you create a plan and you know every time you do something, check back in a few days, in a few weeks to see if that worked. This is a structured approach. You know, sounds very simple, but sometimes we miss doing it in, in practice. And when you have some structured approach like this, it doesn't have to be this, but a structured approach like this uh, will help you not miss something. This is something that we learn, for example, when we're reading uh, x-rays, you know, we, we everyone develops their own method to, to put together all the elements and you're less likely, if you do it in a, in a structure where you are less likely to miss something. Point number three, um, as we said before, non-pharmacological interventions should be implemented before pharmacological interventions. This is the ideal world. It, this doesn't happen usually. It's more common to hear people say, well, I'm just gonna prescribe that, that sleeping medication because I don't have time for this, right? But it, I, in general, our practice, our system should move away from starting with medications and always ask these important questions about, you always do, do, do this approach of describe, investigate, create, and evaluate in terms of non-pharmacological um, interventions. Point number four, the most important ally in all this picture is, is the caregiver. The, the first connection that we have to do is, is with that caregiver. And our goal is to empower the caregiver, give them the, the right tools, so they can manage at home. We have to educate them. We have to be resourceful and connect them with, with these tools. And we have to be there to coach and reassure. Sometimes caregivers are doing the right thing, but they just need, they just need that reassurance from us. Um, many times we have to you know, shift the, the direction we're going, but it, it, many times just by giving the reassurance, uh, things continue. Uh, and, you know, we have to give them information. We have to let them educate themselves. I put a, a couple of examples uh, of, you know, reading material. The Alzheimer's Association has great information or the Family Caregiver Alliance. 
to understand dementia, to understand the stages of dementia, what, what to expect, how to communicate. There are great um, seminars, uh, online seminars on how to communicate. And then things like care links that allows you to increase level of care with needed. You allow the caregivers to participate in the elevation of care by bringing in home health or placement for the patient when, when it's needed, introduction to hospice, introduction to palliative care, give them the tools, educate them. I think, you know, if all of us knew these sort of concepts as, as, as we understand, you know, math or we understand, you know, uh, business, I think we will, as a society, make different steps, take a different approach to dementia. Um, I usually go to the Fam Family Caregiver Alliance website and spend that my first sessions with, with patients when they have a new diagnosis or and the caregivers. I go through these 10 steps. Uh, and, 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 you know, sometimes I, I just use one visit to talk about one step, one of these ideas, and, and let, let them, you know, um, uh, think about it and think about what it means to them. And, and uh, this is very powerful information. Just educate about the nature of the nature. Um, also, it's important uh, as part of creating the alliance is to identify who are you, who you're working with, what type of caregiver you have in front of you. Some some people have, have uh, some caregivers have a tendency to to be depressed, to be anxious. They're very vulnerable to stress. They're pessimistic, and and these people uh, may not have or may not be in the best position to be caregivers. Some other people, some other caregivers are naturally empathetic, flexible, they reach out, they're optimistic, they're extroverted. And they, they may be in a better position to care for someone. Uh, there's research showing that people with negative traits, when they are caregivers, the patients do, do worse. They, they decline, decline faster because they are not managing adequately the needs, the functional needs, and possibly the neuropsychiatric symptoms. And you know, one of the main problems that regardless of who you are, regardless of what your personality is or as a caregiver, one of the main concerns is that most caregivers say when they are in, in this lifestyle of caregiving, one of the main things is that they like, they lack choice and they feel they feel trapped and they feel they don't have an exit. And that's, you know. In, in, in different, not only humans, but in, in other animals, having this situation of no escape is very stressful and, and can have very deleterious consequences to health. So it's important to understand where your caregiver is. For example, another, another way, this is a recent, a recent study by Helen Kales and Leggett, one of her students, where they classified uh, caregivers in terms of their traits, right? Some people are, um, you know, very rigid, frustrated, self-focused. And, and then some people are naturally good, right? They, they have resources, they, they reach out. Either or both, if you, if you invest a lot of time in them, you're probably going to waste your time, right? The externalizer, you can tell them all you can, or you know about dementia, but they're not ready. And it's sometimes usually better to help them delegate the responsibility of caregiving to someone else, to be like a family member, a paid caregiver. It's better to do that and invest your time trying to convince them. And on the other hand, you have the nurturer adapters. They, they are well. They, they don't need you. They are doing naturally. They can probably teach you stuff. Uh, so it's good when you have a learner, someone who, who is struggling but is willing and, and is able to, to follow you. Um, and you can, you can bring an externalizer to be a learner. You can give them some information. Sometimes what people need is time. But if you, if you detect a learner, that's the ideal situation. That's, that's when you can put a lot of resource, uh, a lot of time to, to create this alliance. Okay, number five, communication is key. Coach on communication style and content. Communication changes or the needs for communication changes depending on the stage of dementia. In mild stages, when people are still have, you know, uh, preserved se sense of self, it's good not to argue. It's good to not be uh, not tell people what to do. When when people start getting basic needs affected, you know, uh, try to simplify things, trying to ignore symptoms that seem uh, things like hallucinations. They're harmless, but they may maybe too shocking to see. It's good to learn how to ignore those things. And in in severe dementia, when there's total dependence for for care, is is important to have to focus on the human interaction. Uh, in terms of style, it's important to, I will see an example of that, it's important to, to 
watch or work on our body language. When we talk to someone with dementia, regardless of the stage, but most importantly, in more advanced stages, uh, use our body language to communicate. Sometimes people with dementia don't understand the words are, that we're saying. They understand more our posture, our facial expression, our use of hands. So it's important to coach caregivers and you know coach ourselves or educate ourselves on how to communicate in the right way so we can transmit that information to the caregivers. Sometimes the problem is that caregivers are not communicating well. They're not using the right techniques to communicate. And it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how many medications you bring on board. If the communication style is not the right one in that day-to-day -day environment, you're never gonna make those symptoms go away. And then the content of information is also important. Um, simple words, simple phrasing is more important uh, uh, in most cases of dementia. And then, you know, some people may, may, may want some help you know, when, when speaking. Some people may, may not appreciate it as much. So you have to learn. You have to learn not only the, the basic framework, but also who that person is and what their needs are. Point number six, checking on time. Point number six, use an intervention her hierarchy. Where, how, what, what elements are you going to attack? As I said before, the first element or the first uh, point of entry is your caregiver. That's, that's point number one, priority number one. You can bring all the, um, the interventions that, uh, that you want, but if you don't have an ally, a caregiver that is there to help you implement them, it's not going to work. Now, the caregiver could be the spouse, the, 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 ch the, the child, uh, or a relative, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a paid caregiver, right? Or, or it could be staff in a facility. So ident identify who that is and give work one-on-one, -on -one, create an alliance with that person, right? Recognize their needs, give them encouragement, give them the, give them the opportunity to, to do that psychoeducation and the, the, the psychological venting, um, you know, pay attention to their emotional responses. Once you have an ally, then you, you know, go for the point of less resistance, in this case, the environment, right? Don't, don't work on the patient just yet. Try to see if you can change something in the environment, not only in the attitudes of the caregiver, but some, something else in the environment that could help, right? Make things that are uh, disturbing go away. You know, sometimes mirrors cause a lot of dilutions and, you know, just get rid of the mirrors or if it's an environment that has a lot of, uh, um, um, uh, you know, people are hoarding things, you know, try to make, to see if that environment can, can be improved, more light, more air, you know, things like that. Give, also in terms of routine and structure sometimes, you know, one of the main things that we see is reversal of day, night cycles. People stay up at night and they're sleeping during the day. That's physiologically not good. That can make any, anybody of you go crazy. Someone with dementia can really, really be affected by this reversal in cycles. So, these things about environment are, are very important. Then, um, you know, use your, your non-pharmacological techniques that we saw in the, in the previous slides, that that framework, try to see if any of those techniques work with your patient. And then, then you consider your pharmacological interventions, right? Um, I want to, um, all of this can be used and there are new agents emerging that, you know, showing evidence. Um, I, I want to, to highlight pain control. As I said before, sometimes um, pain is uh, treat, treatment of pain with just a, an over-the-counter um, ibuprofen or Tylenol and NSAID might be the magic, the magic wand. And, and you can control a lot of symptoms by that, helping people sleep. Um, when you use all these medications, uh, be, you know, remind the principles of sim simple regimen the least medications the best and try to use medications with the the, uh, the most benign cognitive side effect profile and then you have a physical restraint this is really a, another expert level of intervention it's possible to to rely on it tempor uh, temporary uh, in a temporary way um, but but you know we we are really uh, trying to 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 um, not get to that stage um, point number seven, I remember tailor, tailor interventions, person center interventions. This create that uh, demands you to, to know the person, know your techniques, know the person and stay creative. What works for one person, even if they, if the patients look the same in terms of their environment and their symptoms, it may not, you may not have the same result or what worked one day may not work the next day with the same patient because, you know, dementia is a moving target. So, so 
stay creative, stay on your toes, and always think of, of the person. Don't think of the method, but think of the person. Um, point number eight, become a structurally competent provider, meaning know that changing landscape of resources around you. Know where your, your case managers are, your physical therapies, your occupational therapies, where your hospice team is, where your social workers are. You know, understand your role in, as part of a team and then uh, create um, a portfolio of resources that you can give to someone. Not every link that you send to someone, not every pamphlet that you give to someone will have the same effect. You really have to be as specific as possible. So there are many things, you know, in our, in our organization, we have um, um, a compendium of resources we, we classify by need. That's something that you can start in your own organization. Uh, so something we have it in a wiki environment. So it's very powerful. People can add things, people can delete things that don't work. Uh, and then people can have little references. So for example, you know, if someone hears that there's a caregiver using this, um, this facility, you know, that someone can say, oh, this is recommended by so and so. And this creating this kind of body of knowledge that is shareable and everyone can um, uh, use for their own improvement as, as a structurally competent provider is very powerful. Okay, uh, number nine, no one can treat dementia alone. Dementia care, especially neuropsychiatric symptom management, is a team effort. Uh, so work, work with doctors, work with nurses, the caregivers, social workers, case managers, um, understand, understand the role of everyone and try to approach uh, the management as a team. So, uh, for example, I'll give you some examples. In the UCSF, we have care navigators. This might be um, um, professionals that are not necessarily with an RN or an MD uh, degree that are the interface with patients and they, they are able to have more um, frequent contact with, with diets, with patients, and they can triage and they can route and they can you know, give um, um, uh, general level information and, and advice. So this is, this is an important, this is very successful in cancer and now in dementia, there's emerging evidence that this is making a difference too. We also have a continuity clinic just for the management of neuropsychiatric symptoms. Sometimes providers, MDs, um, PAs, RNs uh, are overwhelmed with follow-up time and you know, having a clinic dedicated to just symptoms that you know, neuropsychiatric management requires time to understand, to have an interview and to, to evaluate. Is This is not something that can be done in, in five minutes, unfortunately. So having a, a dedicated clinic, um, it, may maybe uh, a, a, a useful step. We are trying to understand the impact that it has and uh, how attractive it is from the point of view of revenue. And also, you know, that balance of revenue versus preventing hospitalizations and, and burden on, on, the, on the rest of the system. So this is, this is something we definitely need to understand, but, but we are implementing it. We have uh, support groups, support groups for different types of caregivers, caregivers in the early stages of dementia, caregivers for people who have more um, uh, movement related um, uh, needs, for example, coming from pe people with Parkinson's disease as opposed to more cognitive. So tailoring the support groups. So you allow the caregivers to identify themselves with the rest of the audience is very important. One, one of the things that I see when I, I recommend uh, support groups for my for my caregivers or the, the patients I've worked with is that they are afraid of how different they are uh, from everyone else. They say all these people look very sick and I'm not that sick and you know I don't think this is useful. So having support groups, a, a good variety uh, of support groups to offer people is important. Not not that you're going to create them, but know where they where, where they are. And we also have a task force. There's a group of professionals in our organization that are interested in advancing the agenda, in this case of, of behavioral management. So if you can create a task force, people who, who are you know, interested in this type of topic in your organization, who kind of starts informally, but maybe more formally uh, with, with time and with, with um, showing efficacy, you, you, can, you can advance your management in, in, this, um, uh, in a group, in a, in a team effort. And then uh, when number 10, when uh, behaviors are, pose a high risk of harm to the patient or, or behaviors, skip all this and go, go to your chemical restraints. Medications 
have a high priority when there's risk of harm. And this, this has to be used act, this actively. If your providers are not using medications in a proactive way, meaning checking on the effects, check, checking the dose quickly, taping, taping it off quickly, communicate with them, I reach out to them and, and um, you know, work with them to, to move away from the medications as soon as the symptoms are controlled. And sometimes you have to even consider admission to the hospital uh, if symptoms are too bad. Okay, I'll show in the next um, 10 minutes a couple of cases and a couple of examples. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's a matter of props. Uh, um, in some instances, certain families, for example, um, Asian families, Hispanic families, the approach is very, um, the families are used to a paternalistic practice of medicine. And, and patients respond well when the authority tells them to do something, right? If, if someone is coming from the, from the spouse, they might not hear, the patient might not hear, but if the spouse pulls out a, um, a little piece of paper with, a, with a do, an, orders, an order from the doctor saying, you should not drive, patients may be more uh, will, uh, willing to, to respond to that. We also had a, a case by one of our former uh, uh, senior nurses who um, told us the, the experience of someone who was refusing medications given by the, uh, the spouse at home, the, the patient started accepting medications where the spouse created a little nurse hat with a cross and you know, she will bring it. He, he will recognize her as an authority figure and then he will respond better. So you see, this is pure creativity that addresses the need of that patient, that accommodates, provides a cognitive accommodation. Another example, when someone has lack of um, inertia or, or apathy, people may be losing weight, they may be hungry, they may not recognize they're hungry, uh, and caregivers are serving them food, but nothing works, and patients are not eating, they may just wander around. One time, the, patient, the, the, the caregiver was so frustrated that the sandwich that she had prepared for the husband was sitting there, and she just you know, um, was frustrated and took a bite of the sandwich. And then the patient, the patient came back and saw the sandwich with the bite, and that was that was a, the the prompting that the patient needed to, to know that that's something that you can actually eat. So he took it and started eating. Was he saw that kind of, you know, very simple um, discoveries that can allow you to to uh, execute uh, a, a particular behavior or facilitate a behavior, and you know, and you don't need Ritalin or stimulant to do that. It, it just it, it requires a lot of observation. During COVID, this is something that our, one of our patients showed uh, reminders, right? If your memory is failing, well, use your environment to remind you of things. Signs, you know, why you shouldn't be doing saying something. You might, you might not remember the conversation that you just had, but if you can read it, you know, get advantage of that. Don't go out, don't drive the car, don't do your laundry. Um, music therapy is important. This is the same same patient. Uh, this is this is public. They, they they made this history available to the public. Uh, they turn the music uh, on during at home. They dance. They do some reminiscence therapy, looking at you know all all pictures of traveling they did. Uh, pet therapy, just uh, um, as specific needs that the person may have to 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 have a good day. Um, music therapy. Uh, it's, it's, it's particularly pow powerful. Um, let me see if I can share this. So the evidence shows that um, symptoms may not go away completely. There's no cognitive improvement or functional improvement, but you mitigate, uh, especially uh, symptoms like anxiety or pacing or shadowing. Uh, when people... Um, have apathy or or there are cases where they are engaging in in risky behavior just because of the nature of their syndrome they have um, 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 repetitive compulsive symptoms you can give them something harmless like uh you know jigsaw and in in some cases like in this case that the person would stay um assembling them for hours, 12 hours, 14 hours a day. And they, it was very enjoyable to them. So in, in um, cases 
and this is part of the Taylor activity, but in cases of compulsive behavior, you can think of you know, low complexity activities, high complexity activities, and you can go from just you know, painting something to actually doing household chores, which happens and, and making people uh, feel part of what everyone else, else is doing is very powerful. It, it preserves a sense of autonomy, of personhood, or my role in, in the family, my role in society, exploiting things that they used to do, you know, helping with, with, with the kitchen, cooking. If they used to be, you know, uh, the cooks for the family, that's, that's super powerful. Um, one case here, this is, a, this is an, a Christmas dinner. And I want you to observe what's happening here in this scene. And I, you're gonna notice something, so an abnormal behavior, but I, I want you to think of not what the abnormal behavior is, but think of what is, what is good about this scene. What is, what is positive about this scene? What is the good aspect of this scene? The good aspect of this scene is that everyone is accommodating the patient. No one is making a fuss about their normal behavior. They're providing accommodation. This is more likely to happen when the patient is embedded in a circle of trust. People understand what the patient is going through and people are, they're, they're savvy and they're willing to give the patient accommodation. No one is throwing their arms in the air because of the abnormal behavior. If the if behavior is abnormal, let it happen. And, and the, the patient will probably enjoy what they're doing. And by not having any, uh, anything interfering, you're allowing his well-being, their well-being. This is, let me show you, this is a more important one. Uh, this is a resistance to care. So this person is in the task, this caregiver is in the task of helping the patient bathe, but the, the patient is not uh, taking it well. The, the main thing is that the, the, the caregiver is more centered on the task than the person. She's not talking to the, the, the patient. The caregiver is really focusing on getting the task done and argues with the, the person, uh, maybe physically argues with them. And now she's trying to put the jacket, trying to convince her reasoning with her that it's cold, that she will be cold. And if she doesn't put the, the jacket on, you know, reasoning, bring her using logic and the patient was not, not doing well. Now, different day, maybe different caregiver with a different technique, you know. Uh, in this case, the person, the caregiver is talking to the patient as she completes the task. She's not focused on the task, she's focused on the person. She asks her, her questions, give her options. She allows the, the patient to interact with her. At some point, the, the, the patient starts scrubbing the caregiver with a sponge. And you look at that, she touches her in a kind of a, um, um, a caress in the neck, uh, eye contact, you know, she has her face at her level. This is where she, she allows her, you see, he's, he's like this um, um, very person-centered communication style. She's asking him, hey, what do you want? What are you going to do next? You know, this is, this is very powerful. No Seroquel, no antipsychotics involved. This is, this is, um, this is very good. Okay. Um, let me stop there. And then we can see the other cases. Yeah, maybe we should take some time for questions. Yeah, absolutely. And then we, Jennifer has uh, the Tipa Snow video to share. So um, I have a question from Jillian Fallon. She's asking about working with caregivers who are dealing with a lot of grief. And I think, Jillian, that this topic will also come up next week where we'll have a longitudinal case like from beginning to end. Um, so you can also, if you're able to join us next week, but we'll see what Dr. Rojas has to say about that. Yeah, we all go through bad experiences in life. And, you know, from your own experience or from what you see with your, with your clients, you may see that grief takes time. We, we, our best approach to that is be present and allow the person to have time. Many times in their own within their own path, they, they come up with their answers, the solutions. As I said before, a, a lot of times our job is to provide reassurance to someone and, and give time. Uh, and no, it's not only about grief, but also about hard decisions on how, when do we elevate care? When do we bring paid caregivers? When, we, when do we transition to assisted living or an, a memory 
memory care facility, or when do we bring palliative care? These decisions take time. Um, the decision of accepting that someone has a dementia takes time. So we just there and, and be, try to be as human as possible and, and be, be reachable, be, um, be approachable. Uh, this is something that, you know, you don't need to be a, a, a nurse or a doctor or a social worker. This is just a very human, uh, in, uh, uh, interaction. No one needs a degree to, to, to help someone else and to give them that space. And maybe it's important for everyone that has contact with caregivers to kind of be aware that they are going through grief. Because I think caregivers sometimes feel like since the person is still alive and they might look normal, that their grief is not acknowledged and it can kind of be invisible. Do you think that's the case? Um, so another question, uh, maybe these are related. So Maria uh, Teresa Espiritu is commenting that, um, you know, paid caregivers, another struggle that they have, and this might be true for family care caregivers too, like, you know, they're really overworked and um, might be really tired and not fully present and that that can affect how they can interact with the patient and kind of respond to their needs. And then Michelle was asking about who trains um, caregivers. I think she was responding to the shower videos um, on how to care that it was um, pretty difficult to watch them struggle. And I think if anybody spent some time in a long-term care facility, you know, it, um, th that's not uncommon, that level of resistance. These are two great points. And this comes out, I think this is a systems issue. We don't have the right training for, I mean, we are not trained as, as nurses, doctors, you know, the, the paid caregivers are, have less attention to the proper training. And of course there's less uh, attention to, to how we pay for their services. So this is a systems level issue. Uh, we, we may, you may find in the community uh, caregivers that, are, are more trained. This seminar is we're start trying to tackle that. I mean, I don't know how much impact we can have, but the idea is that uh, we, we reach out to, to providers, to caregivers who are working day to day uh, with, with patients to, to have some of this information. I, I don't think there's a structured way, you know, in other countries, I can tell you in Mexico that there are new career tracks for caregivers. I think we need this, this sort of movement, but the Alzheimer's Association has very good courses, online courses. There's a whole series, different topics that is going all year round. Some of these used to be in person, but now they are, they are um, uh, over video. Videos by TIPAS No or are also very, very, very good and very helpful. We'll and there are different video series. Yeah, video series that you can get, uh, um, you can pay for them and, and, and expose them. But the problem of caregivers is that caregivers are caring for people. They don't have time to, to get educated. So, you know, chicken and the egg, it's a systems problem. That's, that's what we need to attack. Whoever makes decisions needs to understand that we need to change this. And maybe, you know, you can comment from yourself. I mean, I think all people who work with dementia may experience some level of, you um, stress and difficulty coping. Like I, th I think with any um, kind of job, like I wonder if caregivers need to practice the same kind of like stress management or mindfulness or, you know, like you, your 10 tips said, you know, you can't do everything. You can't do it all. It's a team sport kind of, if there are any like coping strategies that are, that, that can be helpful for caregivers. It depends on the caregiver too, right? That's, it's important to, to see, to understand who that caregiver is. But I totally agree. I mean, ha connecting the caregiver with a network of resources, a network of people who can help. It could start with friends and family, but you know, having people in the, um, in the health system be connected to them can be very powerful. Also, Sarah, you have brought this up that caregivers understand. They, there's a point where the caregivers understand that now they have a new role in life, that they're not just, you know, John or Mary, they are now John caregiver, Mary caregiver. Having, having that step, I think may make a difference in how they cope with grief, with stress, having, bringing new meaning mm. to, to what, mm. what they're doing. I, I think that like can a help. purposeful in. intention. Absolutely. Yeah. And this, to me, in my experience, this, this is facilitated by psychotherapy. And, mm -hmm. and, and this is that 
you know, in my experience, but also the evidence shows that psychotherapy is very important for this. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth Halifax commented that certified nursing assistants, so certified nursing assistants work in nursing homes. And I think in assisted living and memory care, they, they're not necessarily certified, although some of them may be, but they're required to have eight hours of dementia training before recertification. And she said that as a former staff development person, standards of training are poor. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for trainings like this and for training in, in general. Um, there's, I mean, I think in hospital settings across the board, there's very little, that's why we have this event. Um, Mo Monique Hamilton said for individuals who also have comorbid mental health, like pre-existing mental, mental illness, and or substance use disorders? Are there any additional considerations? Yeah, they should be uh, connected with um, the right medical care. Things are not going to happen if we don't work on the caregiver first. And sometimes that means dealing with um, their diabetes, dealing with their uh, anxiety. Sometimes the fundamental issue is their shortened resources. And that just brings opens the door for many other problems. So sometimes the, the main intervention is to, to see if you can help them have a better structured way you know, to get by. Uh, and and that's, that's not a medical intervention, that's more of a social intervention, but absolutely, those take, those take precedent in many, in many times. And I believe that uh, the Alzheimer's Association has advocacy day coming up if they haven't had it already. It's in either February or March. So if um, people want to sign up to be an advocate and advocate, I know, um, you yeah, know, we might be able to get more resources in, in the state. Um, a lot of people commenting on the systems issues and barriers. We need to change that. We need to change that. Systems is big. Yeah. Um, Matt Haslick mentioned caregiver respite. Do you want to just comment? I think that was a really um, profound slide about the caregivers, maybe where you might want to like see that the caregiver doesn't maybe have the capacity to learn the skills that you're trying to teach them and, and that they really need to delegate to a paid caregiver. It's hard. It's a hard transition to make because sometimes the the understanding of the of the caregiver is I want to give everything to my mother father now with dementia and in their understanding the best way to to give them everything is to do everything themselves but they might not be ready to to make that transition they might not be ready to understand that it's better if they just let go if they devote themselves to be the daughter and not the caregiver it, it, it's it's not an easy transition it requires a lot of education and Sometimes a team effort where not, they're not hearing the same message from, this, from one person, but different people are telling them the same message. You know, cases are not easy. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. you, you're not able to, to change that, uh, but you do, do, you do the, the, the best you can. In those cases, for example, a very, a very easy way to provide res respect, respect for, the, for the caregivers to um, uh, register the patient for uh, daycare. Just a few days, or a couple, not a few days, but a few hours a day, a couple times a week, that can release the, the caregiver from some stress. That's a good step. A, that's a, a, that's step. A, the more affordable cost. I mean, Caroline Isaacs was just commenting about um, the cost of care. And I, I think that's another important consideration is that for most families, the, the cost is paid out of pocket unless they you know qualify for a Medicaid waiver. And um, so yeah, I think you know, in terms of what is being done to change the system, maybe we need to have a policy talk and invite someone who's a policy expert. Yeah. And I do know that the Alzheimer's Association is doing a lot of advocacy. I think the Family Caregiver Alliance is doing a lot of advocacy. So the, those are two organizations that I would refer people to. And um, yeah, I just also want to recognize that it's 1.30. So appreciate everyone's participation. Thank you, Dr. Rojas. Did you I, 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 want, I just want to, you know, 10 seconds, the, the change, we, we are all, all stakeholders. So the change will come from us. We need to raise our voice and we don't need to wait for Seth Rogan to create an association. We also need to advance, express our needs in every opportunity possible to, to make that change happen. Yeah, like Mary, Michelle Abrams was asking if Medicare covers any costs and the answer, the short answer is no. Um, Medicare doesn't cover any in-home care or long-term care, just brief uh, long-term care stays after hospitalization. And so state and state funded Medicaid is what covers nursing home care and some in-home care um, for people who are very 
poor. Um, and most people who are middle income or higher income end up paying out of pocket. So a lot of people, you know, really compromise their financial situation and that adds to the stress of caregivers. So with that, good news. <laughs> uh, let's invite Jennifer to join. Thank you, Dr. Rojas. You're welcome to come back every next year. And uh, <laughs> Jennifer is gonna share a Teep the Snow video. And Dr. Rojas, if you wanna stay um, and help answer questions about the video. Great, all right. Thanks, Dr. Rojas, that was incredible with enthusiasm and insight, um, really appreciate it. Um, so when, when we talk about behaviors, um, uh, we often, I think it's really natural, most of us try to jump, if there's a problematic behavior, we try to jump right to like sort of the solution, like what is the plan? What can we do to sort of minimize um, this, this, the problem, the problematic behavior when it's happening? And, and we all, um, everybody as part of these trainings, Dr. Rojas and Sarah, all of us really think that it's, it's actually really critical. And, and the DICE model that Dr. Rojas showed really gets to this. It's really important to explore all of the reasons why that behavior is happening. And like Dr. Rojas says, it has to do with the person with dementia. It has to do with the environment. It has to do with the caregiving and, and the resources. So um, a large part of what we focus on and what we'll focus on in this next few minutes is sort of um, trying to tease all of that apart. So if you were here last week, you met um, Tifa Snow um, in one of the videos um, that was shown. She is an occupational therapist. She specializes in dementia care. She has a goal of improving the lives of people living with dementia and their caregivers. And she founded a, an organization called Positive Approach to Care um, that uh, has a lot of resources around educational material, uh, video resources, and um, she's also an actress. So she um, acts as a, a patient in, in, with dementia in different stages. Today, we're gonna show, she's gonna depict a woman in the moderate stage of dementia, and she has some other uh, people um, on the stage with her. And she's gonna, um, the first video is kind of a before video. So what, what we're gonna ask you to do is watch the video, think about her strengths, Tifa as the patient, think about what she's able to do, um, and then also think about um, what, what are her caregivers doing or, or what's going on um, in her environment that's um, not helpful. Um, and that in fact is maybe sort of escalating or worsening her behavior. And again, this is part of that sort of that eye of dice, the investigation that Dr. Rojas talked about earlier. And if you want, you can write observations in the chat or in the Q&A. We'll watch the video, then we'll stop and, and sort of summarize it, and then we'll go to kind of the after video. So give me just a second to make sure that I share this correctly with you.